Have you been wondering how it actually looks to get a deal done with someone that's in pre-foreclosure? Want a real life scenario? Well, right here, I have a call that I did, a, actually a podcast I did with one of the people I've worked with to close the deal is a $10,000 deal. If someone in pre-foreclosure, it wasn't pretty, but this is the full story and the explanation of how we got it done. So if you're having issues or you with a pre-foreclosure deal or you want to know how it works, check out this video that we shot. Let's start from that position uh, of the deal. So you you had it under contract and you were like, I might have to cancel this. And I was like, whoa, 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 wait, this might be a good deal. Don't do it yet. Tell me what, what was going on at that point. What had you done to get the deal? Like what was going on at that point where you're like, I think I'm just going to cancel? Um, well, what was causing me to cancel it was um, it, it took months for the, and I mean literally months mm -hmm. for the couple to feel comfortable with start, you know, starting to talk to me about the process of helping them. They were an older couple. They were getting tons of phone calls and they didn't know who to talk to, who to trust. Mm -hmm. So eventually I was able to get them to trust me. We ended up getting a contract on the deal. However, what happened was once the title search came back, the liens ended up exceeding the offer price. So it ate up all of what we, you know, were expecting to make in the deal. There were a lot of, and, loans, right? A lot of issues. Right, right. And so that's why I said, I, I think I'm going to have to cancel. Okay. So at that point you had offered, do you remember what price you had offered them for the house? I believe it was 125 is what the initial contract was supposed to go through for. Okay. And they actually owed more than that, you're saying, right? It was, well, at first we were under the impression that it was $105,000 or would cover it all. But once everything came back, it ended up exceeding one twenty five. dollars And there was things popping up left and right, right? As time yes. passed, they were like, oh. Yeah. Wow, you got to pay that off and that off and all that. So when we had met, I had ran the numbers and I was like, this is potentially a deal at like 130, 140, 150, right? That was kind of what I was seeing because I think the ARV was like 250 to 300,000, maybe even a little bit more. And, um, you know, it's in Richmond, right? So Richmond, Virginia, it's, is that correct? I think that's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, so Richmond, Virginia, and that's a, you know, a place that's a hotbed. There's a lot of, you know, good properties and flips going on. And for me, I've never been to Richmond, Virginia. Have you been to Richmond, Virginia? I yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've never been there. So that's the kind of the cool thing about doing real estate is like you can do this from anywhere. Like I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah. So I saw this deal, knew how to get contact buyers. We, we started reaching out to the buyers in that area that we were able to contact. And uh, we started finding because when we had connected, I was like, hey, let me find somebody. So we found someone named Joe, one of my students in my program too. He was able to find a buyer for uh 140 i think that's yes mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. so let's talk about that so we get the we have some showings we have a buyer 140 and i think we tell the seller like hey we'll just pay off everything you owe and that'll be it right is that kind of yes. the, the situation that went out because mm -hmm. and i remember like there being a time where the seller just like stopped talking to you and to me wasn't that like what happened and we we're trying exactly to, like, mm -hmm. what happened at that point were they just like um do you remember like they just for like, hey, let's just give it to the bank. We don't even care. Like we'll ruin our credit. We just, whatever. They just gave up. Is that what was happening? Um, well, there was a second after I got in the first contract, there was another buyer that came in that was mm -hmm. very, very interested in the property. However, this buyer was coming through um, from other wholesalers. Mm -hmm. And against my wishes, my partner who was working with me wanted to work with them. Gotcha. It ended up, um, we're just kind of making, there was an actual buyer, but they were just kind of making a lot of demands and that deal ended up not working out. It was over the Christmas holidays and you know, rightfully so. They didn't, the sellers, close. They didn't close. That's right. They didn't want to move. It was just a, a you know, they had a granddaughter. They were raising a grandchild. It just wasn't a good time for them to move. And so, yeah, so you're a buyer. Then so I came were, in. <laughs> Yeah, in my opinion, you know, in my opinion, when we came in and we started working with you, um, the reason why he stopped communicating was your buyer made an offer, but then he could not find anywhere to stay. 
Mm, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. That's what ended up happening. Yeah. And I remember they were just kind of at that point, they were like, Hey, let's, uh, we're just going to like not do anything. Right. Yeah. He was very excited about moving. He wanted to move um, because, you know, the house was not in good condition and he felt like as if it was going to be an opportunity for them to start over. And I was trying to find them somewhere to, to move, but because of his credit, they were having all kinds of issues. So because he did not know what to do and because he did not have anywhere to go he completely stopped talking to me gotcha and i okay so this is what happened at that point our buyer that i had brought was we we had assigned it to the buyer we had assigned mm-hmm. it for ten thousand dollars to compensate you know us for for tying it up and saving them from you know their pre for from the foreclosure hitting their credit and all that stuff and getting out of there and then they didn't want to move out because this happens all the time they just don't want to go or they don't they say they don't have anywhere to go yes that's that's probably true and, but at the same time, like they're going to eventually have to go somewhere when the ba- when the bank takes it. So uh, we were willing to help them. We were willing to give them, you know, move, move the uh, pay for their moving costs. And I think that's what the buyer that we had assigned it at that point, they kind of just took over. Right. Because we had assigned that paperwork to them and they're like, hey, we you know, we want to move forward. We've already, you know, have our interest in this property. Is that right? That's what was going on. Because I was kind of yeah. out of the loop at this point once we assigned it. Right. So he um, he was working with a realtor who was um, helping him. Um, and so the realtor kind of, you know, took over in terms of the paperwork and in terms of the um, negotiating. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the buyer wasn't in touch with them either. So it was really, you know, I, I haven't thought about this since this happened. And, and this yeah. took place months ago. But it just landed on my shoulders to try to get him to, um, you know, give us a call back and, and start, you know, the negotiation process again. Right. Thankfully, your buyer did not bail out. He he really wanted the property. You know, what ended up happening is that he offered, I mean, he came with some really good offers. He offered manpower because he had his, he had his own crew. So he offered manpower. He offered $5,000 to the seller. Yeah. Um, but like the seller didn't have anywhere to go. So yeah, that buyer was definitely a great buyer in the sense he wanted to help. But l- let's talk about how at the very end, they kind of almost tried to cut us out but because of the paperwork. What I said, we were able, unfortunately, they tried to cut us out, but you can't cut someone out when they assign you the contract, you know? Yeah. Um, well, you know what? Oh, you, you know, so I'm remembering things as you are talking because you did just remind me. Um, so at one point, I am not in Richmond, so I am working virtually just like you. Right. And the, so I gave the realtor and the buyer permission to go. And I thought it would help if they went and introduced themselves and kind of established a relationship with the seller. Then after that, the realtor stopped communicating with me. And I sent you a text or you called me and there was some kind of verbiage that you gave me. It was one sentence. I can't remember what it was, but I sent it over to the realtor and he called me within like 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, I remember. So so for everybody that's listening, what had happened again, she connected the the buyer that we had assigned the deal to, to the seller because they were in Richmond and they were like kind of, you know, helping each other out. And the agent that was help, you know, connected us to the whole thing and the, to their buyer stopped talking to us. Almost like, hey, if I stop talking to them, we don't need to work with them. And for us, we were like, hey, look, like this deal wouldn't have happened and brought to your buyer without us. And he was ghosting. Jacqueline. So I said, Hey, Jacqueline, it's unfortunate that this agent is ghosting us, but all you have to say is, Hey, Mr. or Mrs. Agent, you know, we signed paperwork. We had an agreement. I don't want to have to call the board of realtors and tell them that you're not like being, you know, working with us and trying to get around us on a deal that we did. And because he's licensed and he's not trying to like have, I guess, any derogative marks or whatever, he, he immediately was like, okay, what's up? <laughs> I don't want you to complain. Is that that's kind of what happened, right? You were just like, "Hey, don't don't make me complain cuz don't go around me." Pretty much, right? Exactly. And I know that it was, you know, it was from that verbiage because um I had been trying to, you know, we went from talking on a daily basis 
boxes and he would always return my phone call. So I think it had gone like four or five days. Um, he just wasn't returning my phone call. So when I sent that over to him, he immediately called. So I love it. And someone says, these are exactly the solutions and methods the Painless Wholesaling Program will help you learn and execute on. <laughs> well, exactly. I'm not sure who that is, but uh, thank you for throwing that in there. It just says Facebook user. But look, Jacqueline, I'm curious. Be, be honest. I'm not like tooting my own horn or anything, but do you feel like this scenario, you've been able to do it without you know a little bit of guidance or you think you, think you could have figured it out yourself? No, I, I think the deal would have fallen flat. I think I would have absolutely given up because like I said, I didn't know, um, even from the beginning, you know, I was working pre foreclosures. And so from the beginning, when the liens exceeded the offer price and the buyer, you know, decided they did not want to increase their offer, mm. I didn't know what to do from, from that point. Right. So between you asking me to give you a call and between that verbiage that you gave me to give to the realtor, which probably prompted the realtor to give me a call. <laughs> I 100% know that this deal would not have gone through had I not had your assistance. Well, I appreciate you saying that. And the only reason I bring that up is not just to say like, hey, I'm the man, because obviously we're all improving and where we're at. Mm -hmm. but the thing is, there's so many little details that happen That's in a deal. Right. And I think a mm -hmm. lot of people, they lose out on opportunities because they try to figure out everything themselves. And for me, that's not the way to learn. You need to, if you can connect yourself with people who have already done it and you can just ask them, you're going to progress far faster than if you just try to learn everything on your own. It's, it's, it's exactly. Harder. Yeah, I completely agree. Because you, you, you know, you kind of learn what you need to learn. And then at some point, you know, I hear someone say, especially when you're getting into wholesaling, I don't know about anybody else, but I certainly had analysis paralysis. And so at some point, you know, it's time for you to pick up the phone and you have to start. Well, because of that, with this job, you learn as you go. And yeah. so that's where it helps to have someone like you come in and say, you know what, I've had that scenario. This is what you need to do. Right. And you know, what's interesting, like as I'm, as I've been in real estate for uh, several years now, but I'm still, you know, when I come into, you know, multifamily into certain seller finance opportunities, which I, I always reach out for advice, even though I might know how to structure it, or I think I have a good idea. I kind of want to get mm -hmm. someone that's done more deals than me or someone that I feel like is, you know, has a little bit more wisdom in that aspect. So I think you're always no matter where you're at you, you should always be reaching for others you know in networking trying to find out better ways to do stuff mm -hmm. yeah completely agree and uh, you know unfortunately um people are not you know always available and that's completely understandable but you made yourself available and it ended up being a painless process in the end so i'm very happy a pain it was a painful <laughs> But it was a painless process because I was helping. Exactly. Exactly. You like that video? Hit that like button. Thank you.